Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, our series on libraries in recovery uh, as what is a library if the building is closed was the, the question that originated this series now over a year ago, uh, asking questions related to uh, the, the, what happens to the services? What is, what is a library without the building? <laughs> And that created a, a lot of interesting questions related to uh, internet access and digital services and, and physical materials and even social infrastructure, an important role that libraries play in their communities. And that just kept rolling through the last year and now into year two as part 41 of the series. And this one today is around the, uh, uh, the, the new law and the ruling that allows the use of E-rate discounted funds, e services uh, to extend beyond the campus, the school and the library property and even the parking lot. Uh, so we're gonna get into that since this is a really big deal and a, a, what we think of as a golden opportunity for libraries to take advantage of it in the near term and in the long term. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. My name is Don Means, I'm the director there and uh, the sessions and the series uh, are hosted, recorded by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, and at the helm in the Netherlands is Steven Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA. And our session sponsor today is Kelly Dry, uh, a leading DC law firm that specializes in E-rate, uh, and of course we recommend them for anybody that's looking for support on that. Uh, our speakers today are uh, Dustin Lee from the ITDRC, the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center, uh, based and headquartered in Fort Worth. Remarkable organization. We'll hear a little more about it. Uh, they've been a longtime uh, associate and uh, colleague of uh, GLN and a variety of wireless projects we've been doing over the past few years. Mark Colwell, the Director of Technology, uh, Telecommunications Strategy at Vocal, uh, is another uh, well-known colleague and, and a guy we go to on a lot of questions on certain uh, wireless areas. And then I'm gonna subject you to my own uh, presentation today on a couple of the projects that we've done that we think will serve as possible examples on how libraries might take advantage of this new ruling to extend access. First, we return to COVID, our constant companion uh, since we started on March 26th, a year ago. And uh, this was last week's slide. Uh, things, you know, this flatten out, this uh, drop off failed to keep dropping off. And now it looks like it's heading back up. Uh, the deaths are still falling off, but they're a trailing indicator as our hospitalizations. So we just don't know how how far up this is gonna go again, but just in the US, you know, it doesn't look that great and things look much worse, frankly, in Europe where, where they had been way ahead of the US. The vaccine news, as everybody should know by now, is really extraordinary. It's so quickly uh, created and synthesized an effective vaccine, 90% now in the field, uh, uh, proof of, of uh, resilience or immunity to, to infection. And then the variants have, uh, have arrived and it's not so good, a little more, well, maybe a lot more infectious and a little more lethal, uh, but maybe it's not so bad because it looks like the vaccines are proving effective if you have one. If you don't have one, your risk has gone up. And so we could not encourage people to, uh, if they have an opportunity to be vaccinated, take it. Don't worry about you know the categories and getting in line and all that. If you if this is there, if it's an opportunity, register, get it, and do it. It's you'll feel better. I can attest to it. Uh, so on to the topic today, as part of the uh, ARAP, this enormous uh, bill uh, that's been passed. It's now law, and then part of that is the Emergency Connectivity Fund. This is a seven point two billion dollars specifically for schools and libraries is gonna be administered through the, the E-rate program 
not under the existing E-rate rules, but through the program uh, to support various kinds of strategies to extend uh, access to students and library patrons off campus. Uh, the, the driving motivation, I would say, has been to connect the some 15, estimated 15 million students that lack uh, connections at home. But uh, as ever with E-rate, uh, libraries get added in. You know, they're kind of like a suffix to this program, schools and libraries, like, you know, just an add on. Don't forget the library. Well, we've been trying to make the case that libraries are, yes, they're partners with schools, but they're partners with a lot of institutions. Libraries are, we, we refer to them as the Swiss army knife of public institutions. They do more things for more people than anybody else. And it's fantastic. So people just somehow don't really understand that. Maybe because they don't stand for one particular thing other than perhaps books. Uh, people then prioritize these other institutions related to a specific application, education or health. But libraries play a role in all of those things. And uh, when you add them up, you know, you, your, your head should be spinning. Uh, these are the, the deadlines for comments on this particular uh, fund, the ECF. Uh, uh, they're, they're open right now, but only for another few days to comment on these. And then on April the 23rd, that will be the close for replies to those comments. And we're going to have a, a session on April the 8th, a special session on Thursday, next Thursday, to compile the comments that have come in and then develop ideas about replies. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, Bob Boker, uh, the, the point person for ALA on e, all things E-rate, and uh, John Harrington, the CEO of Funds for Learning, two really sharp guys that know, know this stuff and will lead that conversation. So look for an look for a, a invitation to that. So here's the, the, maybe the main points, at least is what I can see, is it's 100% reimbursed, which is incredible. Uh, and it's also allowing this historical limitation of campus uh, connectivity. And, and it's prioritizing partnerships, which we also agree with. So here it is, uh, there's the session coming up. Keep an eye out for that. We hope you can make it. And so now to today, and we'll go first to uh, Dustin at ITDRC. And uh, Dustin, welcome. This is the first time for you. We've had, uh, we've had Joe Hillis, the I forget what he, what modest title he gives himself, uh, <laughs> kind of the managing director uh, of ITRC and a great guy. You guys do fantastic work helping everybody uh, with anything, it seems like, related to connectivity. Uh, but tell us what you've done. We've, you know, we've been doing projects over the past year, trying to extend these, these access stations, we're calling them. Uh, and we've had funding from ILS to support a uh, you know, 10 or a dozen projects, you guys are out there and you've done hundreds of them. So why don't you tell us what you've been doing and what we're doing wrong? Go ahead, well, Justin. With the, Justin welcome. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me, Don. And it's great to be on this call with uh, everyone uh, here. Um, it's, uh, of course, really exciting to see what's coming out of the American Rescue Plan, especially for uh, the uh, use of E-rate funds uh, in remote learning. Um, that is uh, really one of the challenges that we've been trying to address uh, with the pandemic really pushing uh, education Join the meeting. On online. So um, it's, uh, of course, been critical to have internet access uh, for those schools that are in fully remote or even hybrid learning models. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about uh, what our nonprofit has been doing um, to try to address that uh, concern. Um, so uh, just a, a brief background about who we are. Um, I know there's, there's a lot of words on here. I won't, I won't bore you with the details, but we're essentially a disaster response nonprofit. Um, and we respond to hurricanes, wildfires, floods. Uh, this photo here is actually from a flood and a dam failure uh, in Michigan uh, in the middle of last year. Um, and we're really a, a technology focused a nonprofit trying to help to um, reconnect communities and uh, first responders as well. So um, as these disasters uh, impact 
uh, communities, uh, what we find oftentimes is that the infrastructure is also severely damaged. Um, so you can see one of our volunteers actually on the left here uh, using a, a farm a grain silo um, to relay uh, wireless uh, across the community uh, to get uh, actually wireless uh, access for some students uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a school district there. Um, as well as uh, to support uh, some of the first responders and the emergency operations centers uh, in that, uh, in that, in that uh, operation and response. Um, we do, of course, also do wildfires. So you can see uh, one of the Star Lake dishes in, in uh, the late 2020 uh, supporting uh, the state of Washington and their response uh, to that wildfire there. Um, we do a lot of, wi of Wi-Fi, a lot of telephony, uh, but really anything IT related, uh, that's our core expertise. Uh, we've got about 2,500 uh, tech uh, volunteers um, from across the industries. Uh, so the, all the familiar names that you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Dells, as well as a lot of many smaller tech companies. Um, there are a lot of employees from, from these companies who want to be able to give back to the communities post-disaster uh, and be able to uh, use their skills uh, from their day jobs um, and effectively apply them to alleviating some of the uh, infrastructure burdens that have been placed uh, by these wildfires, tornadoes, floods, uh, and even hurricanes. So here's another photo, some of our uh, vehicle assets responding to Hurricane Laura from last year. Um, we've supported schools uh, assessing their networks post uh, post hurricane. We've supported major fire camps. Um, we do a lot of satellite internet. We do even charging stations to make sure that uh, you know if, if we bring the Wi-Fi to to a disaster, um, that's great. But the, but people need to have the ability to to use their devices, uh, empower their devices in those disasters as well. So. Um, We've, we've also started, started dabbling in uh, UAV, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle or drone damage assessments, um, as well as point-to-point -point, uh, links setting up, uh, uh, trying to help uh, actually carriers to recover, um, in, in, but really in support of the first responders uh, who are using their services um, in, uh, at this particular wildfire last year. So you may be wondering, okay, so we've got this disaster response organization. How does this relate to, to us as libraries, right? Um, so uh, Project Connect. Um, so I, I've talked about the hurricanes. I've talked about the wildfires. I've talked about the tornadoes. Um, but of course, we are living through a pandemic today. Um, and it is a very different type of disaster than the ones we normally uh, handle. Um, but uh, disaster nonetheless. And um, uh, what we have seen, as, as I'm sure all of you are aware, are, are is really an exacerbation of uh, previously existing challenges, uh, especially around digital inclusion and the digital divide. Um, so, uh, folks uh, of the members of the community who uh, may have relied on schools or libraries as their primary source of internet access, um, you know, given the pandemic closing these anchor, community anchor institutions, um, that has become a real challenge uh, for these families not being able to get access uh, to these facilities and therefore not being able to get access uh, to the internet in these facilities um, to be able to, uh, uh, of course, uh, be able to access the education for students, uh, telemedicine for uh, seniors especially. We've done a lot of senior centers who uh, where they, they want to be able to get access to doctors. Um, digital banking, uh, uh, employment resources. There are so many things that are now online. You have to have internet access to be able to, to, uh, to uh, access these resources. Um, so what do you do if you don't? So uh, we've had a lot of communities uh, that have um, approached us and, and uh, asked if, if we can help them to expand community Wi-Fi access. And that, that's, that's uh, how we kind of started Project Connect. Um, so Project Connect is, is really uh, our, our initiative to try to help to expand Wi-Fi beyond the borders or boundaries of, of some of these uh, community facilities. So libraries are, are obviously a huge component of that. Um, most libraries uh, have some sort of indoor Wi-Fi uh, for patrons, uh, but that indoor Wi-Fi really, especially for kind of brick facade buildings, they, they really don't extend beyond those borders. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen cases where um, patrons are really pressed up against 
the walls of the library trying to grab that little bit of signal that's leaking out of the building. Um, so, so, you know, being a bunch of uh, tech uh, folks and geeks, um, we, we were really looking like how, there, there's there's a better solution for this, right? We can we can solve this problem uh, as engineers. Um, so, um, so uh, these are some of the photos that that we've uh, done with Project Connect uh, across the country. So this is up in Washington State, um, where we have these very rural areas where there's not very much internet uh, access to speak of. Um, this one, in this case, we were actually tapping off uh, fiber running along the highway there uh, and setting up uh, Wi-Fi in the parking lot there. Um, so a lot, lot of kind of drive-through parking lot type setups. Um, that uh, seem seems to have worked pretty well uh, where um, you can sit in your car and, and kind of use the Wi-Fi uh, from the comfort of, of, of the vehicle. Um, we've also done uh, even very rural uh, libraries like this one in Aeneas Valley. Um, so this was kind of the very, very small community anchor institution, uh, in, again, in the very rural area of the state. Um, but they, but they, uh, they, they had the ability to get uh, internet back all there, and we were able to provide Wi-Fi on top of that to broadcast out to the community. Um, we also partnered with quite a few schools. Uh, this is one of the schools uh, that we worked with in uh, really inner city Detroit. Um, so uh, rural, as, as you're probably aware, you know, in rural America, uh, uh, internet infrastructure is not so great. Popul population densities are fairly low um, and it doesn't really provide a lot of incentive for the incumbent ISPs to get out there. Um, so there, in some cases, there's there's a lack of infrastructure and that, that makes things a big challenge there. Um, but, uh, but lack of internet access isn't just restricted to rural areas either. So um, we've seen uh, these urban areas uh, where uh, there is also a, a major affordability issue on top of uh, any kind of infrastructure build out uh, challenges. Um, so in Detroit, we partnered with uh, schools uh, as well as nonprofits to help to um, expand uh, community Wi-Fi access, uh, both outside of uh, schools. So you can see a, a very small uh, access point on the corner of the school here, um, as well as uh, in communities, uh, in, in neighborhoods, they, they set up several community centers and we were able to kind of push the Wi-Fi out um, on, into the community gardens, onto the street parking, uh, um, and uh, kind of provide greater access uh, through that. Um, so we've also done work uh, down in Puerto Rico as well. Um, so we've uh, worked with several schools and libraries in that area. Um, we actually happen, we have a partnership that we have uh, going on with uh, libraries Without Borders um, to try to help to expand access uh, through some of the community centers in Puerto Rico. Um, so um, they uh, uh, were able to get some, some grant funding to provide internet access to community centers. And we were able to kind of leverage that, that internet access uh, and then push that beyond, again, beyond the borders of that community center um, so that, uh, you know, even while the community center it may not be open 24-7, community members are able to still access the Wi-Fi um, even while that 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 uh, particular building is closed. Um, beyond outdoor Wi-Fi and the parks and the green spaces and the pavilions and the parking lots where we've, we've added Wi-Fi coverage, um, we've also done quite a few indoor spaces. So um, these photos are actually from New York City. Uh, where uh, in one of the, in actually many of the housing projects, uh, they have um, indoor, essentially co-working spaces that they've set up for students. Um, so uh, the idea here is, you know, students, uh, they need uh, one kind of supervision while their parents go to work, uh, but they still need to get access to the education. Um, so so could, could we put in Wi-Fi to help them uh, uh, access their, their classes online um, from these learning labs uh, that are kind of established inside of these housing projects. Um, so we did a lot of uh, indoor Wi-Fi installations for these co-working spaces for students as well. Um, and again, kind of a great kind of community uh, initiative where there's, there's publicly accessible community Wi-Fi in those areas. Uh, and then of course, libraries. Um, so I think 
uh, somewhere in here, I've got slides on, on how many libraries. I think we've done almost 200 libraries to date across the country. Um, but uh, uh, yes, we, we, we've uh, partnered with a lot of different libraries uh, all from Pennsylvania to Puerto Rico to New Mexico to Washington. Um, and uh, they tend to find that their patrons who, again, were previously working on, on a very, very weak Wi-Fi signal outside the library, um, they really appreciate having a strong uh, outdoor Wi-Fi um, uh, access point so that they can get a much stronger signal. Um, and what we provide for these libraries, um, I hear a couple more press articles uh, from libraries about what we've done in their communities. Um, another thank you note from the Folsom County Library. Um, and and what, what we've done uh, is um, uh, provide the hardware as well as installation free of charge. Um, so I, I think these next two slides, these are actually just from the last week of installations. So we have uh, crews in Vermont right now uh, working, uh, working with uh, many libraries, schools, and community institutions uh, across the state. Um, and they asked us to help uh, to push Wi-Fi um, from the library building, which is this building that you see here. Um, uh, and the Wi-Fi just didn't, didn't get out of the building. But they really wanted to make sure that one that they were covering the parking lot here, so that people could drive up uh, and and park and get drive through Wi-Fi, as well as this pavilion area. They have a kind of outdoor pavilion, so they, they wanted their patrons to be able to to access uh, the Wi-Fi from that uh, uh, structure. And then on the back area, they have a playground area where where parents could watch their children and but still be able to kind of do their their business. And um, so what you see here on the right side is a very uh, small uh, uh, Wi-Fi access point that we've installed here. Uh, and, and as is very typical, we donate the hardware uh, as well as the installation. Um, so we'll mount the Wi-Fi access point on the outside of the building, cable it up, uh, run a cable into the existing network stack. Um, so most libraries in the US have some sort of um, internet there already. Um, so we'll run that into the existing internet that they have at that facility. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll provide support uh, for that access point as well. Um, and then uh, West Hartford Library, kind of similar deal. Um, turns out that this library, they, they run a farmer's market on the weekend, I think just on the lawn to the south of the building. And they also wanted to cover kind of the, their yard and the green spaces where they set up kind of public events, uh, as well as parking lot, uh, the parking lot Wi-Fi again. Um, and here you can see a very, very small sign that we helped them to, to install, uh, let, letting the patrons know that we've installed outdoor Wi-Fi um, in their area. And again, just a couple of photos of the access points that we were able to, to help them put on, on their library. Um, and uh, I, so this, this is a wall of text, um, but uh, the, the librarian uh, let us know just two days ago, actually, um, she sent me an email um, and she thanked us for, for doing what we did uh, and, then, and then was really excited to, to kind of uh, refer us on to her fellow librarians in Vermont. So you can see a lot of exclamation marks here. Uh, amazing, no cost to the library. Um, so this is, this is really what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, so we're, we're trying to get, to, of course, the librarians very excited about um, uh, helping to push their services beyond the boundaries of the four walls uh, of their library. Um, but but uh, kind of even more importantly, to make sure that community members um, have access uh, to, to uh, good Wi-Fi um, and uh, partnering with uh, anchor institutions like libraries um, that has been really a fantastic way for us um, to be able to uh, uh, try to uh, ensure that communities have uh, a resource for them to be able to turn to uh, and be able to get internet access. Um, so that is, I think, really the, the end of my slides here. So, and um, uh, just, a, I guess, a, a call out here. If you have libraries in your system or if you are interested in uh, uh, referring us uh, to any of your anchor institutions, whether they're libraries or schools um, or community centers or other nonprofits, um, we, we certainly welcome folks to take a look at our website, itdrc.org slash project connect. Um, that is uh, where we have um, a, a form that you can uh, request a site. So um, we'll collect a, a little bit of, of information like who the contact person is, um, where that site is located, whether they already have some sort of internet there. Um, and, uh, and then 
the, uh, and then from there, we'll set up a video call to kind of scope the project. Uh, and then we can often very quickly um, get the installations turned around. So um, I think in, in this case, Sandy mentioned that we'd, uh, we had a call and then pretty much the next day, <laughs> our crew was already in the area and we were able to, to get that installation knocked out for them. Um, so the turnaround can be pretty quick um, and we try to uh, help as many communities as we can, as long as our resources are still available uh, for this uh, particular project. Um, I did also drop the link uh, in the chat here. Um, so feel free to click on that in the chat. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's pretty much all I had. So I think I'll turn it back over to Don and then happy to answer any questions uh, that you all may have as well. Dustin, that is so cool. Uh, you know, just beyond words uh, that, you know, that you guys have done so much so quietly. Uh, it's, it's really impressive, and, and thank you for all that. Uh, there is a question, and uh, there may be more questions, but just related to uh, sustainability and backhaul, uh, have you had any issues with the ISPs, these facilities, objecting to the extension of the, of the services off property? So in general, no. Uh, actually, I can't really remember even one instance of an ISP uh, objecting to uh, how we've used the, the service. Um, in We're some cases, uh, yeah, I, I think I guess in, in most cases, libraries they have some sort of business internet plan, um, and and you know the ISPs they expect that those those types of plans to be used um, by patrons and and the public. Um, so we, we really haven't seen any issues uh, with, with, those, uh, with those ISPs today. That's been our experience as well. And so uh, this is a phenomenal story. So I just want to stop and kind of reiterate a couple of points here. One is uh, ITDRC is an all volunteer organization with 2,500 and growing number of volunteers. And these large companies, as well as independents, support it. And it... <laughs> So these huge companies, Cisco, Google, and the rest of them, they have all kinds of uh, resources, right? They have services, they have equipment, they have people, and they have signed on to support ITDRC by supplying that stuff, as opposed to themselves getting in the business of trying to, uh, you know, go into Puerto Rico and make money off these poor Puerto Ricans that have been slammed by the, the hurricane better to have our T ITDRC handle it on their behalf and it's become the go-to vector for all these supplies to, to then you know, meld into this network of, of talented uh, engineers who can just put these things together quickly. So I could not recommend them more highly. You've just seen an amazing demonstration. Here's their map of uh, uh, places that they've, uh, been active yeah. and it's a, a and as you can tell we have a, a lot of uh, a lot of empty spaces in here that we love to fill in so if, if you uh, know some uh, some folks uh, in wyoming or you know some folks in minnesota or even you know in maine or um we love to help as much as we can uh we we do still have resources to uh, help to do additional installations um so please do let us know if uh, if there are areas that we can help with Great. And, and the map illustrates also that uh, disasters, uh, you know, normal disasters, I guess we can call them now, uh, happen pretty much everywhere. They're different. Fires out west where we are and floods along the coast and tornadoes, hurricanes, massive winds, you know, everywhere else. Uh, and ice storms as we've seen in Texas and the Midwest. So call them up, sign up and, and, and make a move on it. You know, don't, don't wait around. You don't need uh, the FCC to give you permission to work with ITDRC. So uh, thanks, Dustin. If you can stop screen share, I will jump in and try to do, do my own here quickly. So uh, I'm just going to touch on four projects that we have funded out of IMLS grants that use different wireless technology and different service models. Uh, the two aspects that we think are kind of various combinations of how these can be done. Uh, uh, the first one is the most typical, Milledgeville, uh, Georgia. This is what we've been kind of started out, got into this wireless part of it. 
uh, with TV white space. And this is a basic DIY TV white space. So the, the library itself is the, is the base station for the signal and it, and it extends this to these remote stations. By the way, Dustin, I love that, that, uh, 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 that, that uh, free library uh, image you had. That's my favorite new kiosk image. Um, and, and, and so these are connected using this particular open frequency uh, TV white spaces become available as a result of the digital TV conversion. Uh, it, it has a lower bandwidth, but it has greater reach because of the lower bandwidth allows it to pass through and beyond obstructions and around things. So that's one version. DIY is the way most of those have been set up. Uh, people do it themselves, or they maybe they hire somebody to do it for them, but it's still their network. That's an internal network, albeit wide area. Uh, Pottsboro, he uh, mentioned Pottsboro. Uh, this is a different scenario other than the ones that uh, Dustin pointed out. There are, uh, it's a partnership with the local uh, wireless SP uh, who has the use of education broadband services spectrum, EBS, that they have a uh, sub license from the local community college and the, and the local school district. So they're trying to connect students at home. That's what the blue, dot, the blue uh, uh, dots are. Uh, but the other ones are uh, library access stations. So it's the same technology, but rather than connect a home, they're connecting a public location and basically for the same cost, which is extremely low in this case. So another way to skin the cat. Here uh, is one of our favorite stories. Uh, uh, well, all of them are pretty favorite for us, but this is uh, Plymouth, Nebraska. They've been on, they presented, and uh, this is uh, a case where uh, the, the little town of Plymouth in the lower left uh, of four, 400 people with 46 students, K-12 students, who have, the town has squat for broadband. And, and so all the, everybody's had to drive four miles up to the upper right uh, corner for the school parking lot to access the, uh, the service. So what they did with a, a grant that we provided for them was set up a, a, a microwave link from the school to the water tower in Plymouth at four miles straight shot, 300 megabit connection using uh, 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 carrier grade five gigahertz, which you'd recognize as a Wi-Fi frequency. And then they spread it, as you'll see in the pop out to four library locations in the little town. This makes a couple of points. One is that, that we look at rural as being very low density. We, we see that when we look at the population, you know, countywide. And we find, though, that most people live in close together in small towns. Not everybody, of course, but a lot of people live close. I mean, this is like a, a one kilometer wide uh, downtown for Plymouth. And these, are, these look ideal for certain kinds of these mesh wireless solutions that are, you know, not, they're, they've gotten much better than they used to be. And so this was a, a fairly inexpensive uh, thing to set up. It was like $17,000 uh, to do it. They did it. They didn't do it quite as fast as RTRDC would have done it, but they did it in, in about a month. Uh, the other asset, uh, as we saw in Dustin's remarks, is that these small towns have really nice assets. They all seem to have water towers or grain silos, and these act as really excellent uh, uh, transfer points for uh, line of sight, which can be much faster kind of signal. Uh, the, the last example here is another school partnership in uh, uh, Texas uh, with Castleberry. It's in Tarrant County, uh, Fort Worth County. Uh, and this is where the school district has taken the lead using CBRS, the, the open area. CBRS is a Mark can explain a little better, but it's a it, it's a range of frequencies that are that are licensed in some cases, in some situations, and others. Uh, if it's not used and it's open, general access. Uh, and so in those cases, uh, it can be used uh, by anybody. You have to set up the equipment and the school district has to connect all their students. It's actually mobile technology using LTE so that they're even connecting students to their actual phone. Well, that's great. Uh, we said, well, can you use that to support fixed stations uh, and partner with the local library? So the school library, the school district librarian and the, and the public librarian got together and they identified locations to set up these, what we call neighborhood access stations. 
And here's one at the you know community center. Here's another one at a, a mobile home community, you know, uh, that, that has uh, low uh, connectivity. And a third one at, uh, what was that? They were both mobile homes, two mobile homes. Okay. Uh, so these are really simple. They were really simple for them to set up as add-ons. So be on the lookout for uh, other kind of partnerships. And, and the school partnership really attracts us, one, because even though the FCC is lifting these restrictions, before they lifted the restrictions, schools and libraries could already share bandwidth. Uh, they could allocate, you know, around, but there were no issues around that. And what we find, and this is, you may all be aware of this, but certainly what we found in the Nebraska case was that the schools are much more well-wired than the libraries are, generally speaking. Uh, they're, you know, they have larger school districts, and they have more resources and IT staff and so forth. And so they're, they're at a pretty high level now of connectivity. And, and yet the libraries are also in the business of supporting students. Uh, well, actually students of all ages, but after our students, or in this case, kind of anytime students. And it's a natural opportunity to collaborate with the school to talk about where would be good places to support students. That's what this is an example of right here on the screen. So look for those opportunities to build out something like uh, a community learning and information system, we could call it that, uh, because that's where the future, I think, is headed for this stuff. Um, this is our entry into the favorite uh, library kiosk uh, uh, contest. This is a, uh, I don't have uh, rights to use this or to sell this, but this is a, an image off of, of a Chattanooga uh, somewhere, not Chattanooga, sorry, in Tennessee, where they've set this up. It has solar panels on the shade and, and you can see the, the uh, uh, charging plugs there on top of this table and, and then the little free library on the side there. So there are a, a, a hundred ways to create these kind of stations around for anybody to use. And that's the library's business is, is anybody. So uh, we encourage you to get ready to do this, to uh, to take advantage of all these funds and these permissions and fulfill that goal, long-standing goal of libraries to extend themselves into the community and meet people where they are and where they have needs. This looks like the future of libraries to us, and we'll be tracking that for, for a long time. So with that, I am going to pull up here and, uh, and, turn it over to Mark Colwell with Vocal. Mark, welcome back. And uh, tell, us, tell us what we've missed. Well, thanks, John. No, you, you did a great job of running through a variety of different um, options to get service out into the community. And um, I've got, um, you know, I reached out to Don earlier this week and I said, hey, we've got a mobile hotspot program and that's a common way to do this as well. Um, I'd love to connect with more people. And he said, yeah, come on, but you have to also talk about uh, wireless solutions. So I've got a little bit of both in my presentation and um, I'll kick it off here. Um, going. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, connectivity options for anchors, both kind of private LTE, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, and then mobile hotspots. Um, so, you know, I think the common link here, Don, is, is really, I spent about a decade in Congress working on broadband issues and Congress I think because of the COVID-19 pandemic really recognizes that connectivity is so essential and specifically anchor institutions play a, a really important role in getting folks connected. So you've highlighted the, you know, the 7.17 billion for E-rate, um, which is certainly something we're excited about, but I, I didn't wanna uh, leave out that there's an additional $200 million for IMLS in the American Rescue Plan Act, and another $10 billion for the Department of Treasury capital construction, which, which might be used for uh, broadband build out as well. So these are all, and this bill's got a lot of good things in it, but specifically on, on broadband connectivity, it's got some great stuff. And so I guess the question that many of you may have is what, what could we do with that to help extend our services deeper in the community? So we'll start with kind of you know, private wireless networks. Um, you know, Don's already highlighted a lot of different spectrum bands and there may be even additional ones coming on. Um, I help co-chair a spectrum group with the Shelby Coalition, 
and we, we examine a lot of these issues. Um, and so I'll give you, I could go on and on about other bands that might become available, but the two that Don really touched on that I think are exciting are CBRS and EBS. So in the case of CBRS, um, this was a band that the Navy used for naval radar systems for a long time. And as you, as you might know, I grew up in Kansas uh, and there isn't much Navy in the middle of the country. And so that spectrum is not being used. And, and so the, uh, basically the FCC decided, let's come up with a sharing system. So that, you know, if the boat is on by New York City, maybe the network's not available because the Navy radar is using it. But as you get further inland, uh, that, those frequencies are available. And so that's what really what CBRS is. It's a shared system. The FCC also auctioned off licenses uh, for part of the band, but the, the rest of it is unlicensed. And if no one in the licensed part is using it, you can use the whole band. And so what's good about CBRS is you can get pretty decent speeds or, or throughput out of it. Um, there's equipment available off the shelf that you can buy today, um, and there's handsets and so forth. So it's not like you're going to a manufacturer and saying, hey, make me a custom handset. You can go buy this stuff today. Um, a lot of it is software defined, um, and so that makes the cost even lower. Um, the only real kicker on CBRS is the range. Um, because the power levels are a little lower than other bands, the range is approximately one mile. I was reading an article yesterday, the city of Tucson, Arizona, uh, is trying to build out a network and they thought they might need a couple thousand CBRS radios placed around town to get the kind of coverage they need. But for a library to get an extra mile of range out of it, definitely better than, than your kind of standard Wi-Fi signal. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and you don't have to buy a license. Uh, licenses can be expensive. On the EBS side, um, you know, my, my organization is an EBS licensee. I'll mention this in a moment, but Educational broadband service was dedicated to education back in the 60s in the Kennedy administration, believe it or not. At that time, it was used for television. I mean, over time, the FCC has changed the rules and allowed for broadband access, but they never actually fully licensed it. So right now, about half of the U.S. in terms of geography um, has uh, EBS sitting there not being used. And so the FCC had a proceeding a couple of years ago. We fought very hard to get anchor institutions, the ability to apply for licenses. Um, the FCC has decided they're gonna auction those licenses off. But first they um, allowed for rural tribal entities to apply for and get licenses. So uh, about 154 applications were granted last fall. And there's a lot of money in these, uh, leg this legislation that's come out um, for tribal entities. So it'll be really exciting to see. The one advantage of EBS compared to CBRS is you get um, a much larger range. So your coverage is, you know, eight to 10 miles if you're doing fixed internet, a little bit less if you're doing mobile. Um, and there may be some other bands in the future that we could look at, but I wanted to highlight those two um, issues. And then Don, if we want to do questions later on on other wireless, happy to do it. The other topic I wanted to cover is, is my organization and our mobile hotspot program, um, uh, Mobile Citizen. So since the pandemic has broken out, we've had some incredible growth with our hotspot program. And I really wanted to get in front of some more libraries and schools that we could maybe partner with. So my organization, Vocal, has these EBS spectrum licenses. And because of uh, opportunities created by the FCC, we lease our spectrum. In exchange, we get two kinds of royalties, cash royalties, which help fund our, our digital, our social equity programs. And we get lines of service through our commercial partner. And so that's what Mobile Citizen is. Uh, they are the, the service arm to put these lines of service to use. And we do that through highly subsidized, affordable internet service. So what do we offer? We, we have an unlimited uncapped data plan that is $10 a month. We, we charge it all up front on an annual basis, but um, it's truly uncapped. We have users you know, using a terabyte of data a month in some cases, because this is, uh, for a lot of our low income users, kind of their home internet connection. Um, we, our commercial partner for a long time was Sprint, um, but Sprint was purchased by T-Mobile and they'd merged together. Um, and so our, our devices today work on the Sprint network and roam onto the T-Mobile network. It's their nationwide network, which is great. Um, and T-Mobile continues to build out in rural areas. So we're getting even better coverage all the time. And um, our hotspots, like the one you see here, can connect up to 15 users. So um, it can be a real solution for, for multiple uh, family members. Mark, uh, who, yeah, go ahead. Are you screen sharing? Are you imagining you're screen sharing? Yeah, I am. You're not. Well, let me see if I've got. Um, 
ability to do that. Oh, I'm I mean, sorry. It's a great story. Uh, the verbal is fine, but. <laughs> well, yeah, here, let me, let me share my screen here. I'm sorry I didn't okay. click it in. Great. But he, here's, uh, here's how Mobile Citizen works. We, we work directly with libraries, schools, nonprofits, and social welfare organizations. Um, so we have a case study of the Kansas City Public Library on our website where we're their partner for the, for the hotspot program. Um, and we work with other folks, like you mentioned, Chattanooga. We work with Deb Socha's organization there in Chattanooga as well. Um, you're probably thinking, what's the kicker here? Uh, there's really only two restrictions. We don't sell to end users. We work through other nonprofit organizations and, and schools and libraries, and we don't participate in RFP processes. Um, but that's kind of it. To give you a comparison of how our service stacks up, um, you know, we've got, uh, you've got to buy a hotspot and you've got to buy service. In a lot of cases, hotspots can be kind of expensive. Last year at this time, actually, there were no hotspots to be found anywhere um, because everyone was sold out. But you know, a typical hotspot from a commercial provider might be $200 on up and service might be $60 a month. Our program, you know, we sell our hotspots for $80 and $73 and our, our service is $10 a month. So, you know, if you're a library looking at, at the overall cost, you know, $200 a year for, for internet services is pretty good. Um, and you're not putting a $200 or $500 device out into the community where, you know, sometimes these things don't, don't return to the library. So that gives you kind of a, a, good, a good market comparison um, for our devices. And then I just wanted to quickly say, you know, if you're interested in signing up, uh, you can go to mobilecitizen.org uh, slash get started. And um, you got to submit a little bit of information to us. Once you're approved, uh, you can receive your hotspots in, uh, in three to five business days, which is pretty exciting. So uh, Don, happy to talk about the spectrum side, which is half of my day job or the hotspot side, which is the other half of my day job. Um, uh, but here's my contact info. I'm happy to connect with any of you who are interested. That's great, Mark. Uh, I think we've, you know, we've got, we've covered Spectrum a, a number of times. We have recorded sessions on Spectrum and, you know, I touched on it. We both touched on it a little bit today, but I think the, the hot spots are kind of what's hot, uh, if you will, right now, because it's, it's kind of an obvious thing that people are thinking, well, they, everybody can kind of understand it because it's kind of like their phone only without the phone, but you know, it's a mobile, mobile uh, Wi-Fi access point. So uh, a couple of questions. One is uh, what do people connect to when they check out a library hotspot? Uh, the so internet, the library or it's just it's you can it's figure. using it's using the the sprint network so it's like your typical wireless network anywhere where sprint's got coverage that's what your device is connected to the hotspot itself and then you've got to have a computer or a tablet or a phone where right. you're using the wi-fi so it's so the one the device connects to the network the tower but then it has it's using the wi-fi signal to connect to the end user devices so your computer is exactly. using your standard 2.4 or 5 gigahertz so just to the open internet, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay. okay. Uh, well, that's that's great. Uh, and 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 so these seem really simple. What would what would prevent using one of these to outfit a uh, an access station like the ones that we saw at Dustin? Uh, put up or even the ones I put up, yes. you know, a fixed location, have one of these there for, you know, public use. You certainly could do that um, and, and have it, you know, connected. I, I think the, the big limitation is it's got a battery just like a phone and the battery might run out, but actually that link zone device that I pointed out, you can keep it plugged in and turned sure. on all the time. Sure. Um, so that's kind of the only limitation. There have been devices in the past that if you kept them plugged in all the time, the battery would, would end up uh, being, uh, dysfunctional but um right. yeah you could you could connect it the other you know the exciting opportunity that we hope someday we'll be able to use is um you know if you've got a sim card and you could attach it to our data plan you could find something like a cradle point and connect this to a bus or a bookmobile um and then also you know t-mobile is launching a home internet product it's kind of like a you know it looks about the size of a uh you know paper towel roll or so and it actually has a, a plug in, you plug it into the wall and put it in your window and it's, it's a home broadband connection and it connects to their cell phone tower. And so as they're, you know, rolling, they're using the EBS spectrum today to roll out 5G service. They're adding a ton of capacity. And so this is their idea for how do we get all that capacity used? 
they're going to have a cell phone network that also allows for home broadband. And we hope to offer that someday. Okay. Well, this is, you know, this is a fascinating example and also uh, another illustration of the, the range of resources, uh, of technologies, spectrum levels, business models, service models. There's, a, there's quite a lot to choose from and it's a lot to learn about. And that's kind of the point of our session today is to try to provide a, a kind of an inventory of opportunities and, and choices, but to encourage everyone to, to explore these, you know, set up a project of some type, look at one of these, you need to do an evaluation of where you are, what kind of frequencies are available in your particular area, how do they perform, uh, and, and figure out a, a, a service model, a partnership, with a, like in Pottsboro, it was the, it was the ISP that was willing to uh, work with the, uh, the schools and libraries to create a special, uh, a special subscription rate, you know, because they're, they're using uh, the community asset of the educational uh, broadband spectrum in the first place. And, and they're like a lot of places, the local wireless ISP is, is a member of the community. They really care about it. So there are just a lot of ways to go here. The, uh, one of the interesting questions, uh, Mark, relates to uh, SIPA compliance. You know, libraries uh, have to filter, as do schools. How, how, does, it, how does it work with these? Yeah, um, we, we have a SIPA uh, filter that we can add to any device, turn it on and off. It's a toggle on off switch. And the, the, you know, what, what is prevented or not prevented is run by the provider. So in our case, Sprint runs the whitelist for the websites, and then you can turn it on or off depending on if you want it on or off. So for school partners we have, for instance, you know, they come on, all of them have to have that on. So. Uh huh. And then the library gives the list to Sprint. Well, they, this, uh, Sprint runs its own SIPA compliant list. Um, uh, so, so our option on our back end, if you're a customer, is we can turn the SIPA filter on or leave it off. Um, but we don't, we can't customize it for you. There are some technologies out there. Know, how do you know? Just because it's a library, does it, you don't know whether they're, they want to be compliant or not. How do you know? Uh, they tell us and we can turn it on or off. Um, so if you're, if you're a library that wants the filtering on, okay. like you have a, hotspot program for children, you know, we can yeah. turn those specific devices on. Okay. Uh, uh, Roy Hoover mentions Cradle Point, which is a, a provider of uh, library kiosk, you know, the usual kind of large scale uh, machines that handle physical devices, but they also do, of course, communication. Are they, uh, are they a partner in this or are they a user? They're not, but you know, I did see a press release a couple of weeks ago. Uh, T-Mobile is starting to outfit public transit buses uh, with, with devices. And I presume that they're cradle points or some equivalent, um, because you kind of have to have a power source in the bus, um, and a little better technology than just a, a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, so we're hopeful. I mean, our limitation is, uh, we have our data plan has to be approved on that, but, um, our agreement allows if, if they're using our spectrum. And so if they were using 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, uh, for the cradle point, then we would, uh, get to have access to those devices. Okay. And last question for you right now is uh, throughput. What, what kind of performance do you get with these? I mean, I, I'm sure it's a variance, but what's the range? Yeah, you know, our, our uh, 4G LTE hotspots uh, do pretty well. Um, I've done some speed testing where I've gotten, you know, close to 100 megabits per second. I think an average guess would be somewhere between, you know, 30 and 50 uh, if you're within a reasonable distance to the tower. Um, but I've seen some 5G speed tests. We do have a 5G device, actually. It's called a MiFi 2000. Um, it's a little more expensive because it has chips and patents and so forth in it. But those I've seen speed tests where they're using just part of the EBS and getting 300 megabits, 400 megabits a second. Um, so I think that's going to be pretty exciting. Well, those are all impressive numbers. Uh, the, the 5G so-called, I suppose, <clears throat> employs uh, uh, high band frequencies, so-called millimeter wave. Well, yeah, so T-Mobile actually has three types of spectrum. They have low band. They bought that old TV broadcaster spectrum. And that's their, you know, the commercials you see with the big magenta map. That's low band, wide coverage. But their speed increases are only about 20% more than their 4G LTE. Then yeah. they have this big chunk of mid band, 
which is their kind of coverage 5G network, you know, kind of it's, it's, it's faster speeds and better coverage than most. And then their millimeter wave they deployed at the Super Bowl actually in Tampa. So those speeds are, you're getting over a gigabit a second. They just don't travel through walls or trees and they only go, you know, a couple blocks down the road. This is, this is a basic principle, I think, uh, on, on spectrum. The lower the frequency, the, I mean, there's a relationship between frequency and bit rate. And the higher the frequency, you know, the, the more bits, but the more easy it is to interfere with the signal, uh, which is why I think these very high frequency radios have to be, you have to be close to them. That's been a barrier to right. a wide uh, deployment, but they've targeted the urban areas, uh, which are, you know, flood where the Wi-Fi is flooded already. Uh, Jim asked about uh, end user access to EBS. There's not per se, uh, James, uh, end user access. It's the, it's the licensee, which is either a uh, actual educational institution as in the beginning, or one that has been sub-licensed from that to use it as a commercial purpose, or now a lot of the spectrum is being called back and then auctioned out. Uh, but these will be uh, providers of one sort or another using uh, those particular frequencies. Uh, any other questions? We're coming up on the hour. Uh, this has been chock full of stuff here. Uh, thank you, Dustin, for adding the additional information there in the chat. Uh, any more uh, questions here for our speakers, which I guess includes me in this case. Um, I just want to say, Dustin, the, the stuff you guys are doing is really amazing. So you know, if you ever need hotspots, let us know. Maybe we can you know, form, strike a partnership. And we actually, we have done some disaster relief programs uh, when the hurricanes hit the Gulf previously. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, the, uh, the cell phone towers go out in those types of situations, but they don't go out. You can use a hotspot for it. They do go yeah. out. Uh, that's been a point. <laughs> Yeah, we, we get creative, as I mentioned in that chat, uh, we get creative with uh, whatever we can we can find in disaster. And in some cases, we get lucky and there's still a cell tower standing around there. Um, so I, I definitely love to chat more with you, Mark, uh, around, uh, around that. Awesome. Good. That's uh, one of the things we hope to do is, uh, is help partnerships form because there are so many to be done, uh, you know, on almost every scale as well. Uh, but the point about cell towers is... Uh, is true. Uh, we had, you know, I, I'm in California, we've had fires a couple of years, I guess three years ago, we had fires in Sonoma County, uh, knocked out 80 cell towers, and mm -hmm. they were out. I mean, so you're dead, basically, there's no power, and there's no connectivity. Uh, and even if the cell is up, everybody's trying to use it, and it's almost almost useless. So this was a point about our uh, second nest project, which by the way, I uh, mentioned, I didn't mention those examples I gave are detailed on the uh, community second nets page at giglibraries.net. So that's a, an IMLS grant that we're in the final stages of and have done a preliminary final report on that page. So it lists those projects and more it has detailed reports from each one, and it also uh, links to their video presentation because we've had most of them on uh, one of our Zoom sessions here to talk about what they've done. So those are all resources I recommend highly to, to everyone to check out. Uh, we have more coming, uh, but the, the notion to engineer a secondary network, which is what got us excited about TV White Space, to build wireless that could do direct connection among anchor institutions as second responders, right? So we've got FirstNet, a national network connecting all of our police, fire and ambulance. So now their, their radios are interoperable, theoretically. And, uh, and that's a big advantage. That was, you know, that's smart. But what about everybody else in a disaster scale event? What? I mean, everybody needs connectivity. This this example of the cell towers being out, and, and when we talk about data and information, this is my become my favorite example of the difference between uh, information data is a text message in a, in a lights out long term scenario of the message, mom, we're okay. 
So how much data is in that message and how much information is in it? How much value of the information is in that? You know, a world of difference. And so any connectivity in, in dire circumstances is super valuable. We keep talking about and we're obsessing over capacity, but connectivity first and connectivity will pull capacity. We've seen that wireless pulls fiber. You deploy a, in, a wireless endpoint, you'll generate demand, you'll be able to quantify demand and it'll help justify deployment of fiber, which is what we all want. So uh, this, is, this is another reason to invest in wireless. And you'll find a lot of local entities, you know, a lot of local decision makers and councils and county supervisors uh, are, are highly versed in other traditional infrastructure, you know, concrete and asphalt. They can do this in their sleep. But when you start talking about ICT, they go, ah, no, that's uh, Jill over in the, in the computer room. She does all that. Well, not anymore. You know, this is really important stuff at the, at the public policy level, at every local level. And we would say every community needs a, a formal strategy for connectivity. And it's not just, you know, for loading cat videos. It's for every kind of important application, e-government, all these government forms that people need, uh, emergency uh, scenarios, as well as the future of smart infrastructure. Yeah, what's going to drive all that? It's communications technology which makes it even more important in a sense as a kind of a meta infrastructure to tie them all together. So it's really complex and it's really important. So that's a, that's a reason to learn about it. So we hope we've contributed to that a little bit today. We wanna to thank all of our uh, speakers. And I'd like to ask everybody before we close here to unmute. Can everybody unmute for us here? Please unmute because we wanna give our uh, our presenters, uh, a round of applause, please. So thank you very much, everybody. Yay! Aloha! Hey, uh, Don, I think I think James Walker had a question. You had your hand raised. Uh, I maybe had another question. I tried to answer it about EBS. Yeah. James, had, did you have a question? I, you had a question I, I did, if it's you. okay. Go for it. Uh, it was just a, a, when it comes to the technical skills for a community to implement um, towers, what are those skill sets usually? Because I work with, uh, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. I worked with the um, library regional, um, regional library system on a CARES Act grant. And I'm working with a lot of uh, health departments and workforce development agencies that see telehealth or workforce development as a real opportunity in these um, federal bills. So they wanna know, um, how, well, what do you need to do to go up on a tower? And, you know, yes, we have, okay, we have the spectrum of whether it's CBRS or EBS, who does the work to make that become a backhaul for a solution? What kind of uh, training is recommended? And I certainly would like to learn more and how to partner and support both the work of local and the work of um, the ITDRC on um, training up more people who can use this as an entry level IT job um, to support these community networks. Thank you. Great question, great point. Dustin? I can go ahead, Dustin. You probably have more experience climbing towers and uh, installing, uh, but I can chime in on some other topics. I'm actually less of a tower climber uh, than, than some of our other volunteers. Um, but uh, there are tower climbing certifications. Uh, so there are kind of industry groups uh, that uh, provide standardized training as well as um, uh, certification to ensure that, that the folks have the skills to safely and effectively uh, install equipment on those towers. Um, but uh, I guess more specifically for EBS and CBS, uh, maybe I'll toss it over to, to Mark uh, to, to address. Yeah, I think Dustin's right. From what I understand, there's uh, certification classes. Some of them are, you know, weekend long or so, cost a couple thousand dollars. Um, one of the ideas that, you know, Vocal, we're, we're a social equity group, we had considered funding um, the some of the tribal nations to train their community members because I mean, ultimately you get the funding and you put this thing up, but it's going to break down and someone's got to be able to, to fix it. But also it's a skill set and an economic development tool. So we could fund one training class with 30 members and now they have a new skill set that other wireless companies, big wireless companies will pay them to do um, to build their region out. And so it's kind of a win-win and all the way around. Uh, but that's, um, I, I do know of an organization that does this. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the kind of idea we had was we could, we could pay for one weekend with that group and train many people that then have a new skill set 
um, to help their community and, and maybe get a new job. There, there are a couple of uh, skills groups that we've come across. Uh, one is the, the, you know, the, the climbing, sort of the technician installation side of things, the physical uh, uh, setting up of, of antennas and, and so forth. And if you're if you're dealing with telephone poles, it gets more complicated. But the the lower level is the telecom level. The top level of the wires is electricity. It's a different training to get up there, but you'll be below that. But that's a, that's a kind of a, a you know a, a skill that that can be I think learned pretty quickly. The other one relates to uh, setting up and tuning radios, which is a different order of things uh, that would tie into network administration. So these are all really valuable uh, skills on the open market. And another reason is is the point Mark was making to get into it both to develop skill sets that are valuable in the market, but also develop knowledge about this stuff. Even if you don't deploy it, you need to be a more informed consumer about what's involved if you're going to buy it from somebody else. So you'll, you'll have an idea of what you're actually getting into because uh, this is infrastructure. So we're over a little bit. That's okay. Uh, this is good stuff. Um, huge need for telecom related. I'm reading uh, Monica's comment. Yeah, okay, apprenticeship okay. program, good. Thank you for that. Uh, so I think we will, we'll hang out, but I think we'll close the formal session at this the recording at this point. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, our speakers. This will be uh, posted within a couple of days on the uh, pandemic response page at giglibraries.net where the prior 40 sessions sit waiting for anybody to come and, and look at them. They've been, now they've all been uh, uh, transcribed for closed caption and translated into more than 10 languages each. So we want to really want to make these accessible and usable and ultimately searchable. Uh, so that will conclude our uh, official recorded session today.